Welcome to Conductors, Composers, and Singers, Aspirations, Interactions, and Careers. Local resident, Dr. Harold Rosenbaum will give us an insider's look at working in the world of music. Harold is the award-winning founder and conductor of professional choir, the New York Virtuoso Singers, as well as a volunteer choir, the Canticum Novum Singers. He is also the author of three books, his latest, just released last month, is a memoir titled My Choral Journey, A Life of Musical Exploration and Offerings. And these books are available on Amazon. Welcome, Harold. Thank you. And welcome, everybody. Um, so uh, I've been conducting for 51 years. Can you all hear me? You can hear me, right? OK. And uh, as you can imagine, I've had a lot of interesting experiences, both here and abroad. And, and, and I have had the great pleasure of working with um, many, many, many composers. I would say literally without exaggeration, I've probably had over 500 composers come to my rehearsals, uh, like the dress rehearsal when I'm doing their piece. And um, I've, you know, obviously I've collaborated with many conductors well maybe it's not obvious but um i'll explain uh, uh, about my personal experiences I'll, I'll talk about my personal experiences with singers um mostly soloists people i've hired um and about my interactions with uh, composers and conductors and th their interactions with each other which is even more important which is sort of like what this uh, lecture is about and I'll also I'll give some historical context uh, now you can just sort of google or read about a lot of what I'll be talking about but I think it's nice to just bring up some of the historical um, facts and uh, interesting things while I'm talking about um, <coughs> my life you have to excuse me I'm I'm, uh, I'm fine but I had COVID two weeks ago and sometimes I get a little cough um, I'm fine though. So, um, just a very little bit more about me, because it's interesting uh, for this lecture to know that I've taught in four universities, um, mainly in terms of number of years at Queens College. I taught there for almost 30 years. And then I was at the University at Buffalo for 19 years. I was at Juilliard one year and uh, at Delphi for two years. And I've uh, conducted, a, I don't know, something like 1,800 concerts. So, um, and, and I've commissioned composers. I've commissioned 120 composers. And every piece I commissioned, I performed as world premieres. So, uh, let me uh, start off by giving a little bit of history. I think it's, now remember, it's, you know, it's composers and conductors. I'll start off by saying, that um, some of the well-known composers that we all know, like Benjamin Britten and Aaron Copland and uh, Leonard Bernstein, you know, conducted also, obviously, <laughs> Leonard Bernstein conducted. But, um, you know, Britten was a good conductor. Uh, Stravinsky was uh, a good, you know, good conductor. How can you not be a good conductor? But he's a little stiff on the podium, let's say. Um, but I'm not being critical. How can I be critical of, of, of Stravinsky? Um, Ned Roram. I don't know if you know who Ned Roram is, but he's considered the, great, the greatest, you know, composer of art songs since Schubert. Can I just stop a minute? Um, Liz, um, I'm seeing three people, which is great, but I'm wondering if I, can I see more? Is that possible? How, is that, how does that work? Oh, maybe I click on view, gallery. I don't know. Anybody know? Um, okay, doesn't matter. So, um, yeah, even Hindemith conducted, but Hindemith had a a little shake, a little neurological problem, not necessarily always shaking, but uh, like Kurt Mazur, who conducted without a baton because it was tough to hold a baton. Um, and uh, people, you know, cope with that. Who's going to tell? you know, Hindemith, that he, they'd rather he didn't conduct, but that he'd play with them. But I actually know a story by 
Sam Adla. Now Sam Adla, um, he was he's like 95 now, Pulitzer Prize winner, one of the great teachers, one of the great pedagogues of the 20th century. He said he was playing in an ensemble at Yale. We're talking, you know, 70 years ago or 75 years ago, and Hindemith played along, and then Hindemith decided to stand up and conduct. And he was shaking and his conducting wasn't that good. So they, they found a nice, gentle way of telling him uh, that he'd be better in the ensemble by saying, by making sort of mistakes on purpose and saying, uh, Maestro, we need you here in the ensemble to support, you know, the viola section, that kind of thing. Um, there were no conductors, of course, way back in the Renaissance period. The first conducting was done in, I guess, the late 17th century. And we all know the story of Lully, the French composer, uh, French composer who conducted by um, knocking a big stick on the floor, but he hit his foot, he got gangrene and he, and he died. Not on the spot, but anyway. But let me um, talk a little bit more about con composers as conductors. Well, Leonard Bernstein, of course, of course, you know, one of the great conductors, right? Uh, a little bit hard to follow maybe in a sense. Well, that's, that's uh, something we, I should talk about briefly that, um, you know, if you go, if you go online and you see conductors um, like of college choirs, I did this little survey. I saw, I, I, I typed in on YouTube in the beginning by Aaron Copeland. That's his greatest choral piece, I think. And I saw four wonderful, wonderful, fabulous high, college performances of it. But the conductors were so divergent and you know they, they didn't have any kind of really standard technique they would do things like that which only their students would know how to react to because they met with their students four or five times a week you know but um i had a um i'm i'm gonna be like jumping back and forth this is like i have notes here but my head is so full of ideas i'll just be doing a lot of anecdotes and just go with me bear with me for example I did a concert with Ennio, Ennio, thanks Ludwig, with Ennio Morricone. You know who Ennio, Ennio Morricone is? He he wrote The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. He wrote all these spaghetti westerns. He's very, 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 very famous, right? Um, Mission, the Mission, that movie. And he brought his orchestra, his orchestra from Rome. And he came and he, uh, I was hired to uh, pr provide the choirs. So I combined a lot of my choirs and we performed one night in Radio City and the next night at the in the General Assembly of the UN, the United Nations. And he was very hard to follow. My singers complained to me. So um, I decided, okay, I'll make believe I'm turning pages for the pianist. And I was all the way on stage right. And the singers knew to sort of angle a little bit towards me. So I would, you know, stand there very carefully and you know, doing this very, very small motions. To hold it together, and he didn't. He didn't know I was doing it. I don't think. I. I, I also, frankly, I. I also did that for one or two other com, uh, conductors, but I won't mention their names. They. They're so. They were so sweet. Um. So you know. Uh, it was really Mendelssohn who rediscovered Bach and conducted from a podium, but before that, you know, com composers and and leaders of ensembles would sit at the keyboard. Like Mozart, you know, they sit the keyboard and, or the first violinist would conduct. Even today, it's well known in my field that um, a lot of players who work with visiting conductors who they can't follow, they just look at the first violinist and they stay together by, by looking at the concert master or concert mistress. Um, okay, interrelationships between composers and singers. Well, here's an anecdote I'll read to you. From, I got this online, Handel and the Battle of the Divas. How the rivalry between Handel's star sopranos and their fans led to fireworks and a right royal ding dong. Star singers were essential for the success of Handel's opera seasons, but sometimes they could be more trouble than they were worth. In 1722, he engaged the services of Francesca Cuzzoni. She was one of the finest sopranos in Europe but was known to have a fiery temper. Well, like, uh, like, like uh, um, Kathleen Battle, right? 
By the way, if Kathleen Battle had married Harold Axe, the pianist, she'd be Kathleen Battle Axe, but she was already a Battle Axe, so she didn't have to marry him. Anyway, that's just a joke. In rehearsals for her London debut, uh, Cuzzoni refused to sing one of Handel's arias, complaining it had originally been written for another singer, but Handel was just as stubborn and the matter was settled when he threatened to toss her out of the window if she didn't. Now, I never treated singers like that. In, 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 all, in all my years as, conduct, as a conductor, I don't think I've gotten, you know, visibly angry or, you know, negative in that sense. Um, oh, thank you, Mar Maria, <laughs> for that. Um, I, I like to, you know, I'm, I'm not an old school conductor like, like Toscanini, the great com conductor Toscanini, who uh, after give, being given a birthday present from the members of his orchestra, a beautiful watch, you know, he, he threw a little temper tran tantrum and threw the watch down and it shattered on the stage. Um, so I, I think conductors um, really don't have that, that attitude anymore. Um, I can think of some really, really fine conductors I've worked with personally who I, I really admire, the, their rehearsal technique and their physical technique and the whole manner of rehearsing like Bob Spano, Robert Spano, who's, you know, was the conductor of the Brooklyn Philharmonic and the Atlanta Symphony. Now he's moving to Fort Worth. Uh, Sir Charles McCarris. What a, what a great person. So um, uh, together, so focused and really great to work with. And Lucas Foss, Lucas was, you know, Lucas was in a friend of and came i believe he well lucas was was um like um Ber leonard bernstein and andre previn um pianists conductors and composers and lucas was a lot of fun to work with all right let me tell you about some stories about in my life working as a conductor working with composers the interaction so as i said i've commissioned composers but i've also um, performed hundreds of pieces by living composers who are invited to my rehearsals. Uh, when I did a, a concert, a tribute concert to John Carigliano, one of the really great composers, and his partner Mark Adamo, uh, I didn't know they were gonna, they were going to come to six out of seven rehearsals. Like they lived down the street, and they decided to come to all my rehearsals basically. And uh, but they were so sweet, you know, and and. Um, they, they would, okay, how can I put this? A composer can only put so much in the score. Not, you can't, that's why you have, you know, umpteen different interpretations of Beethoven's fifth, for example, either da, 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 or dun, 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 da, you know, this is so much they can put in the score. So it's up to the conductor to interpret. And, um, I've never ever had a composer at one of my rehearsals who didn't like something a little different that I did that they didn't think of to notate quite that way. Uh, so, you know, I, I respect them, they respect me, but I would never vary, like I would never do something pianissimo if they write fortissimo, that's crazy. I would never do three quarter time if they write something in four quarter time, <laughs> like the Star Spangled Banner. It's in three quarter time, but I've heard it in four four time. You know, like uh, uh, who's the the great? Uh, oh God, the the woman uh, Whitney Houston, who sang sang the hell out of the Star Spangled Banner before a, a baseball game, and but it was in four four time. <laughs> oh say can you see? By the... But anyway, uh, back to composers and conductors yeah and it's it's also important for a composer to know when to speak up in rehearsals and it's important for a conductor to tell the composer if you have something to say save it until the until the until the break in the rehearsal so for example you know i don't really i don't think it's necessary by and large, to have a composer come to come to like two or three or four of my rehearsals unless they really want to, because we're just woodshedding, you know, we're just uh, working it out, you know. But uh, 
So if even at the dress rehearsal, if they have something to say, well, if for the, in the dress rehearsal, what I do is I just run through the first half of the program without stopping. So the singers can get a sense of pacing and, uh, and how much volume to give out before they have to sip, sip some water maybe. But, and then after, after that, I, give, I talk about what we just did because I take notes while they're uh, singing in colored pencils, which are erasable pencils. And then I, you know, in the break, the composer talks to me and uh, I convey their feelings, you know, to the choir. And then we rehearse the second half. Um, let me talk about, there's so much more. I mean, this can be a 10 hour talk. I can go on and on, but um, let me talk a little bit about singers and conductors besides, um, yeah, let me just talk about that. So uh, <coughs> I've had the great pleasure of hiring hundreds of soloists, some from management and some without management. There are reasons to get managers. Some of them don't choose to. Some of them, you know, are not taken by managers, let's say. Um, when I work with managers, I try to tell them, which is the truth in my case, I'm not a I don't, I don't have a big budget usually, and I don't have a deep pocket. So I try to tell them, you know, okay, that you want $3,000 for this singer, I can give you two, you know, that kind of thing. Um, in fact, in, in the, in the 1980s, I believe I've done the, I've done the beam, I've done the St. John Passion of Bach five times. And one time I was trying to hire Sam Raimi as the you know, baritone as, to play the role of Jesus in the St. John Passion. Now there are only 57 measures in this hour and 40 minute piece in which Jesus utters something. And sometimes it's like three notes, like da, 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 four notes. <laughs> so I'm figuring, let me just go for it. So I called his manager, his manager was nice. Sometimes they really stuck up, you know, but this one was nice. And I said, look, I know, you know, Mr. Raymond gets a lot more money than I can offer. Uh, I said, I can give him $2,000. So he said, well, Mr. Raymond usually gets 20,000 for, for a concert, but I'll ask him. And he asked him, he got back to me like the next day. He said, you know, he would have done it, but that particular night, that particular week, he's singing Don Giovanni at the Met and Lip Liparello at City Opera, but he would have done it for $2,000. Can you believe it? That's so nice. Um, so I work with so many soloists. Now, let's start with, let's start with the top ones, like people who are really good and they come from management. Um, so if you if they do so, uh, certain ornamentation that I would never have thought of, and maybe I think it's a little bit extreme, I tend I tend to just sort of go with what they want to do uh, because you know they've been around the block and they're famous and all that. <laughs> and but one thing, whether it's a famous uh, a famous singer or not or a student or anything in between. I don't just uh, run the piano vocal rehearsal, you know, from, I play the piano, so I, I, I usually, uh, you know, do it myself. Um, I don't run it by me starting out with the tempo I choose, like an introduction to the aria. I ask them, what's your preferred tempo? And that wins them over right there. And I'll tell you, 98 times out of 100, even though it was, even though it might not have been my absolute preferred tempo. I go with them because I think musically it can work. But more than that, it's within their voice. You know, it's like what they can do. For example, if you're doing something coloratura, which means like a lot of fast notes, like ah, 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 and some con com some singers just can't handle coloratura that well because the vibrato is too wide. And so, what am I going to do? I let I let her do it slower or him slower. Um, <coughs> interactions with singers, oh, with the singers. Here's an interesting re, um, interaction I had in Paris. I was conducting four, what I thought was going to be world premieres by Ravel in the Madeleine in Paris with, the, with an orchestra, um, a French orchestra, professional orchestra conducted by Hugues Reiner, who's a nephew of Fritz Reiner. This was 1988, but it turned out, um, it's a long story, I won't bore you with it. 
it's actually not boring, but I don't want to take too much time with this, but I ha happened across these pieces that were never performed before, ever. Okay, I'll tell you a little bit about how. A colleague of mine at Queens College, R.B. Orenstein, is the, it was and is the world's leading authority on Ravel. And I said, R.B., do you have any choral pieces by Ravel that have never been performed before? He says, sure, come to my house. So what? So he took a microfilm from the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris. He speaks eight languages. He's unbelievable. And he showed, he showed me a photocopy of these Prix de Rome entry compositions. You know, Ravel never won the Prix de Rome, the P-R-I-X. Uh, he came in third, but, but that's another story. He should have won it, of course. But he, he, they lock you up in a room for a week and you have to produce a cantata, a fugue, you know, all kinds of compositions. So, um, yeah, it was never performed. It was never published. And I spent hundreds of hours copying over the parts from the, from the full score. I copied over the flute part, the violin part. And I found hundreds of errors and sh smudges and things. But I, conf I, I conferred with Arby and we figured out, okay, so we're doing one piece. And the soloist, soprano soloist, was supplied by the orchestra, which which they call the Orchestra de de Apostrophe Europe, um, which they um, the government of France organized in 1989 for the to celebrate the 200th anniversary of France French independence. So um, you know, so Ugg Reiner conducted the Durafle Requiem, which I trained my chorus for, and I conducted these four premieres. Oh, they weren't world premieres, it turns out, at the last moment, because a university in Edinburgh had performed them. They also got hold of the manuscript, and they performed them in March, and I did mine in June. That's all right. We call them French premieres. So anyway, this it's it's June. <laughs> right. What's the, it's June. It's hot. And the soprano soloist struts down the aisle in high heels and a, 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 minx, a mink coat or something with a heavy coat that she was wearing. And we only had one rehearsal with the orchestra and she didn't know the music. And I gave it for her little solo, which was like eight measures long. And I tried it over and over again. And finally I said, I'm sorry, goodbye. And I dismissed her on the spot. And I turned to my wife, Edie, who was in the soprano section in my Canticum Novum Singers, and I said, you're doing the solo tomorrow night. There's no time to rehearse. Let's get to go to the next piece. So that's, and she did it beautifully the next night. And we have that on tape, actually. Ah, oh, stingers. Okay, at the University of Buffalo, when I first got there, um, they, the department had gotten rid of their music education uh, degree and everybody who wanted to become a music teacher had to take music courses from the department and education courses from the education department and I had succeeded uh, I, and they they moved the the choir director to somewhere else and <coughs> I was brought in I was asked to teach there and I, I flew there every week you know, 30 weeks a year from LaGuardia to Buffalo and I stayed like overnight um, and the kids were not happy that their teacher was not there anymore. So they gave me a really hard time at first, but I, I eventually won them over. But the funny story is that um, I was doing a Handel Oratorio my first year there, obviously in English. And these I was auditioning soloists. And most of these kids, all of them, I guess, uh, studied with the other teacher, studied voice with her. And they'd come in and they'd have no sense of phrasing at all no real musicianship display. They were just blurted out and they would roll every R. I mean, roll the R. You know, it's like, it's like a three second roll. Like, or I can't even roll, by the way. That's, that's why I'm not a great opera singer. I can't roll my R's and my voice sucks. Other than that, I'd be a great opera singer. Anyway, um, so they would roll R's and I would tell them, no, I don't want rolled R's. I want flipped R's, you know? And they would, they were horrified. Well, Miss uh, Simon, whatever her name was, uh, said we should roll off. I said, it depends on the conductor. I, I told him a lesson. I said, you know, um, I say, you have to go with the conductor with certain basic things. You know? And that's one of the basic ones. The the one one singer who rolls his R's masterfully, who I, I cannot criticize because it just seems to fit no matter what. Even when he's singing a solo and then the chorus joins in and they're flipping the R's and then he sings and, and he's rolling the R's, Peter Piers, which Benjamin Britten's a companion for decades, the great tenor, Peter Piers. Um, wow, 
I woke him up from a nap once, I think, when I went to visit Benjamin Britten's home library. It's his, uh, now a wing of his house was turned into a library. And I was shown some of his own conducting scores of the St. John Passion, for example. And I think I rang the wrong doorbell because he answered and he goes, well, goes down the road, down the next, anyway, he didn't yell at me. Um, Copeland was a good conductor too. I met, I was, now I'm jumping back to <laughs> composers who were good conductors. Um, yeah, and uh, Ned Roram. Now Ned Roram is, now is, he'll be 99 years old in October. And I'm planning on doing a huge uh, retrospective of his music, a day long concert of all of his like 60 chamber choral pieces. Um, and I, I did a, a concert for his 70th birthday and also his 75th birthday. I was in his apartment, you know, he showed me all the pieces he wanted me to do. Now he stopped composing, you know, he said, I've done everything. He's so prolific. And I read that he once got up to conduct his music. And he, the first thing he said was, um, I'm telling you right now, I'm not a conductor. And they said, come on, you can do it. And he did it. He was so nervous. He never conducted again, which is fine because, you know, we, we have all these great compositions. It's sort of like William, Sh uh, not William Schumann, who was, who I knew very well. He was on my board of advisors, the president of Lincoln Center and, and Juilliard. Um, but the Robert Schumann, who his, his fingers were so small, he tried to stretch them by hanging himself from the ceiling by his fingers and he destroyed his piano career. So he had to compose. So good for us. Okay, here's another, a little story about a, a, a not such a good ending for the story working with a, 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 a singer, I won't mention his name, a singer who, who uh, I got from a management. And I had the flyer all printed and we were like two weeks ready before the concert and he pulled out, he got a better gig. And he said, sue me. What am I gonna do? I'm gonna sue him, I had to you know, get, get somebody. But that's, that's so unethical and unusual. I also had an experience um, with, uh, okay, here's a, here's a really good story because it, it involves a, co a conductor, which is me, a composer. I won't mention his name because I wasn't happy with, with what happened. And singers, okay. So I was approached by a composer to conduct a world premiere that he wrote, three hour long work, uh, supported by a foundation. So it was paid, pretty much paid for. Uh, very, 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 very complex work, which I studied for months and months for big chorus, <clears throat> big orchestra, dancers who come into the audience wearing black, and a, a saxophone quartet, I think it was. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, sax, no, uh, chord, oh, string quartet. Amplified music, two pianos, full orchestra. He showed me the music. I said, look, I'll need, I said, let's hire the Brooklyn Philharmonic because at that point I was the choir master of the Brooklyn Philharmonic under Lucas Force and I hired, they hired me a lot and my Canticum Novum singers a lot, like two dozen times. And I hired them a few times, like when I did, conducted the Verdi Requiem in Carnegie Hall. Well, that's another story. Remind me about that, that soprano soloist in Carnegie Hall. Um, <laughs> please do, actually. But let me get back on track here. So uh, I told the composer, look, uh, this is so complex. I'll need six rehearsals with the orchestra. But he only had money for three rehearsals. So, you know, we ran through things. We didn't rehearse much, uh, but we got through everything. And... Um, he hired the soloist. Now three of, and they were all from management, and three of them were superb. I mean, how they learned that music, it was superb singing and beautiful singing, and it was complex music. The fourth one didn't know the music at all. Well, here's, an, here's another example. And the only time I had to rehearse with them, or I should say the first rehearsal, was um, Thursday before the Saturday concert. The first rehearsal with the quartet with me alone, you know, piano vocal rehearsal, which was followed by two rehearsals with the orchestra and then the concert in subsequent days, he didn't know the music at all. I was in shock. The concert was like three days away or two days away. I said, why did you even take on this role? He said, well, no, I said to him like, why, why don't you know the music? He said, I didn't have money for coaching to be coached. 
Now, why did his manager send somebody who's not a not a good reader and a good musician? He had a beautiful voice, but he has trouble learning music. So I called my dear friend David Arnold. David Arnold is somebody I had hired 30 times over 30 or 35 years who happened to be free for the concert. And he said he would do it. And um, it's it's a lo long story, but he, yeah, he, he did it. He did it, but I had to dismiss uh, that that con that uh, singer on the spot there. And the composer was really unstable mentally, let's put it that way. So he would come to the, the rehearsal. The, he came to the dress rehearsal. I told him, look, David put himself in a hotel room and just to study your music night and day. He doesn't have every single uh, word perhaps, you know, uh, uh, there in his in his brain. Uh, because the the words were um they weren't by a poet they were like a scientific textbook and the, you know there was like it's like really good conductors i have worked with about and that fast he had they had to spew out these words that were like from a textbook and he just couldn't do it all he had perfect pitch he learned the music and he called me um right before the concert he said let's meet at 6 30 backstage in avery fisher hall and i got there and he had tears rolling down his face he says i can't do this I said, David, do it for me, do it for me and do it for everybody. I said, leave out, just leave out some measures, just do it. And I told the com com composer not to come early, not to confront David. And he did. He came into the room while I was working with David to soothe him. And um, he started behaving badly. And I never screamed that loud or that long when he was poking me in the chest, the composer. I said, get your, and I started cursing at him, and he, I, I, I must have been really frightful because he ran, he, and he ran out of the building. You know, he showed up at the concert. It turns out he stopped the check. He stopped David Arnold's check, even though David did a superb job. After the concert, he stopped his check. Oh, I had the good sense to, though, to um, make sure that uh, my singers got paid and I got paid and the orchestra got paid ahead of time because I suspected something, but somehow he had the he he had uh, the task of paying the singers and the soloist, and he paid all of them except one. Oh, it was a horrible time. Um, and then, of course, when I worked with Morricone, you know, um, his gang of uh, cronies were were really difficult to work with, and they even threatened to hold back the money. You know, it was really very challenging. One of my singers uh, after the concert, so I was so emotionally disturbed. I mean, so, so, so like, um, well, I was so <clears throat> emotionally tired from all this, or the pranks, or the, the attitude of the, of the, his staff, that she said, here, take a Valium. I never took Valium. I, you know, I said, oh, no, I don't take drugs. I can't do it. No. <laughs> but uh, to give you an example of the tension, uh, on stage at in the general assembly of the un the concert was supposed to start at eight and over by nine so they didn't tell us there were going to be luminaries including the secretary general of the un and all kinds of you know famous people talking so think of it i brought my singers on stage at five to eight at 10 40 the music started they were standing there for two hours and 40 minutes while everybody was talking. And the professional singers especially, I mean, everybody was furious. And that's why I was so upset after the concert. Okay, so let's talk about nice things now. <laughs> I'll get back on track with, uh, you know, some other story. Here's a story. When I, my first conducting experience in Europe was when I was invited to conduct at the Madeira Bach Festival. Oh, Ludwig. And the singers you wanted us to remind you about, I forget who that was now. <laughs> who did I want you to remind me about? Uh, no, 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 I don't know. Somebody might remember. You said, My brain. A, you said a, um, a soprano at Carnegie Hall, I think. Oh yes, thank you, Heather. Okay, <coughs> I won't mention her name, but you know, in the Verdi Requiem, there's a solo by the soprano 
which is so striking. I mean, she was wonderful, but she was just sick. She was ill and didn't tell me. Um, so there's a, a part, very quiet, where she, her final three notes are, Requiem. She goes up to a high B flat, right underneath the soprano high C, pianissimo. I didn't know she was sick, so she goes, Requiem. She stayed on the same note. And I, I was saying in my, in my head, the, half the audience is here for that one beautiful, glorious, high, soft note, and she didn't do it. Oh, Harold, I'm sorry, I was sick, I, I didn't do it. Okay, what can I do? It's after the concert already. Um, what does one do when one has soloists who are, for whatever reason, you know, you, you've secured soloists, sometimes it's not the best situation, uh, you don't have much choice, and one of them is having a little more trouble than the others uh, in like solo quartets or, or trios. So you have to decide, whether you want sort of a traditional configuration in front of the conductor on the sides of the conductor, like soprano, alto, tenor, bass, or do you want the one that needs the most help next to you? And that's what I've done many times. I don't tell them why, but I figured this person might forget a note or go off and then I'll just sing their note and bring them back in. I can't tell you how many dozens of times in my life I've had to sing notes to bring singers back in. Well, I'm talking mainly, you know, university choirs or, you know, lesser, lesser choir, lesser uh, level of such situations. But yeah, you have to do that. So a conductor has to know the music that well. You have to know each part. If the alto section goes off, the soprano section, you have to turn to them and sing their notes. I mean, these, these things happen. Um, so, um, okay. Commissions, when you commission a composer, you have to have a written agreement, obviously. And so, you know, I, I just finished a big project over the last six years, ending ending three years ago, where the ASCAP Foundation gave me money to give composers, and we commissioned 50 student ASCAP young student uh, young composer award recipients. Now, most of today's greatest greatest composers won that award in their youth. So ASCAP gave me this, you know, boilerplate contract to make sure that everything uh, is in writing. Um, and uh, I told them I want a piece that's five or six minutes long. You know, one person came up with a piece that's 10 minutes long. I didn't, I wasn't happy with that because I was doing 10 pieces on one program. You want each one to be, you know, four or five or six minutes long. And then you have one that's 10 minutes long. Um, one time, uh, rather recently, maybe three or four years ago, I commissioned, I, you know, it was a, a batch of them I commissioned and one composer decided to write something that was so difficult, which is fine, you know, because my professional group can do anything and has, you know, done extremely complex music, but this piece, it went beyond complex. <laughs> I mean, what's beyond complex? How about complex and undoable at times and not written very well? So I uh, I devoted, if I remember correctly, something like 11 or 12 hours to, oh, this, this was when I commissioned only five composers on that concert. So four pieces I devoted two or three hours rehearsing to, and his piece I devoted 12 hours to rehearsing to. So it cost me thousands of more dollars that I wasn't expecting to have to pay because it took so much rehearsal time. And then uh, <coughs> after the concert in the reception, he, he never even came over to me. Like he did once, he'd introduced me to somebody, but a few days later I said, I won't mention his name, I love him, he's great. You know, he's very, very talented. I don't really fault him. But at the time I was feeling, you know, when, you're co when you get commissioned by a conductor and you're doing a performance with a professional choir and a public concert where critics come and you get a, an archival tape, the least you can do is go and say, great job, thank you, you know. <laughs> I, uh, right, but, you know, but he said, oh, I didn't even think of it. I, I said, all right, I get you, he's very young, you know. There was a, there was another time, uh, this is really funny. Um, again, I can't, I'm not gonna, bad mouth anybody with giving names, but uh, a composer who I knew I've known for decades. Um, I did a piece of hers with my professional group 
And I did it well. I thought we did very well in rehearsal and performance and everything. But I noticed in rehearsal, the dress rehearsal, she was in the audience going like this. I mean, maybe she had a headache, but I don't think so. I think she was just being a little too picky. And then after the concert, she came backstage and she goes, thank you, maestro. And she walked away, you know, the bare minimum, <laughs> you know. Uh, now, if I did a bad job, you know, they can curse at me. I don't care if I knew it, if I knew I did a bad job, but uh, it's just courtesy, you know, basic courtesy, right? Okay, here's, oh, oh, I know, back to the Madeira Bach Festival. So I was invited to conduct the St. John Passion by Bach at the Madeira Bach Festival. Madeira is this uh, island off the tip of Africa, it belongs to Portugal, and they had a festival. Uh, all the performers were from New York. And they hired two professional solo tenors because one night the, 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 one of them would, you know, with careers. And uh, one night, one of them would do like the, the role of the evangelist in the St. Matthew Passion. And then the next night, my night, the, the role of the evangelist in the St. John Passion. But one of them got sick. The other one got sick and couldn't do the St. Matthew. So my guy did it in, play, in his place the night before. So he came to my concert. It's like a, 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 a professional pitcher in baseball. You don't use a, a pitcher for two, two days in a row. You have to give them three or four days rest. He wasn't rested and he sang beautifully, but he sang flat a lot in the first half of the concert. And here I am, this young conductor. And I, I said to myself, should I tell him? I said, yes, tell him. So I went to his dressing room and very carefully, I said, beautiful job, but there's some flatting going on. And he didn't react well. He was very defensive. And yet he sang every note in pitch the second half. So he said to himself, okay, maybe I was flat. I'm tired, but I'll adjust. I'll adjust. I'll listen more carefully. So I, I was glad I, I, was, I told him, you know, I said it very nicely. Um, so Liz, I can go on, but, and, and we have some time, but do you want, is this a time when we should ask if there are questions or what? Uh, yes, that's, that's fine. Um, and let me, um, I'll let people unmute themselves. Um, so if they have any questions, they can go I'd ahead. Like to see. I'd like to see people. I see 13 participants. How do I see people? Well, they have, they have their, <laughs> they have. Uh, oh, put, uh, oh, well, if you'd like, put your, turn yeah, your video they'd on. Like, so that's can, their choice. I mean, <laughs> they might be eating dinner. That's your choice. My they hair is in their pajamas. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> Yeah, but your hair is always, I'm only kidding. I like Maria. Maria came to all my lectures during COVID, and she my liked online you lectures. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so any questions? If not, I'll go on. Um, okay. Composer organizations. There are- up uh, You right have a question that just popped up. Well, how else can you give, you know, suggestions with, I, I didn't know he was going to be defensive, but, <laughs> but you don't want to upset anybody when they're performing the night of the performance. So, you know, basically, I think I've earned people's trust and I have a reputation for being, you know, nice, but, but, you know, getting uh, what I want out of people. So if they trust me and I approach them nicely, They'll go with me. It's the same thing when when you are younger than yeah. Look, I started Canticum Novum when I was 23. I had a long ponytail almost down to my waist. I have this straggly beard and you know I was like I wore a poncho with beads and I started this <laughs> Canticum Novum and at at the first I, I I auditioned 200 people. I only accepted 12. You see, I wanted a really really good group and I got it and we got rave reviews right away, but. Uh, and they they pretty much respected me. I mean, they definitely respected me, but when you're young, you have to prove yourself. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if I answered the, the question there. Um, but uh, yeah, like Bob Spano, who uh, I worked with eight different times, great conductor, 
brilliant and he was very congenial with his players but they they knew when he when he would say to them do you think we should do this or what do you think of this they it was rhetorical you know they, he didn't, they didn't expect uh, they knew he didn't expect an answer they just went with him um another really good conductor is thea musgrave a good friend of mine she's she's now writing she just finished her first act the first act of her opera um, it may be her fifth or sixth opera she's 95 years old folks and she composes every day and she and uh we have a great relationship i've done most of her choral choral music um okay what else is so much fees yeah um oh i talked about that oh well let's talk about leonard bernstein and glenn gould talk about interactions between conductors and performers glenn gould I, was one of the great pianists but and there's even a, a youtube video about this about the whole situation where he was playing a you know, a, a harpsichord concerto on the piano, of course, with the New York Philharmonic. And they just couldn't come to terms in terms of tempo and, you know, the whole bit. The, his, his interpretation was so different from Leonard Bernstein's. And Leonard Bernstein, before the concert, just told the audience very sort of diplomatically, let's say, that, you know, we're both, uh, we both uh, have our opinions and we didn't quite <laughs> agree on some things and but here it is and they just presented it you might want to take a look at that, that that's an interesting situation uh i know a pianist helen grimo um helen grimo helen grimo g i g r i m a u t i believe one of the world's great pianists oh my god um she had a uh, a head budding disagreement with the conductor, I think it was Claudio Abau, again, you can look this up, in terms of a cadenza in a Mozart piano concerto. He wanted her to play it a certain way and she wanted to just make it up as she went along or something, but it was a fiery exchange. So that fits into this lecture because we're talking about interactions with conductors and, and performers. Well, she was not a singer, but she was a, a pianist. I had a situation once when I worked with a singer, um, wonderful singer, and I conducted the orchestra in the introduction to the aria in a Handel or a Handel oratorio. Now it was either Samson, um, Joshua. I did a whole bunch of Handel oratorios, so I, I set the tempo because that was a tempo we agreed upon in rehearsal. Hello. So I'm setting the tempo and he comes in like he goes one, two, three, like slowing down drastically right, right when he came in, you know, because he wanted me to slow down with him. Well, I have three choices, I guess. I can just dramatically slow or four choices, dramatically slow down to meet his demands, his vocal demands, you know, at the moment, or ease into it so that there's a little bit of a clash, you know, he's going a little too fast, I'm going a little too slow, or the vice versa, and we're meeting, it takes like five measures to meet. Um, we'll stop the concert and tell, and just have words with him, we'll never hire him again, which I never did after that. But, you know, how dare a, 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 a singer do that? Because I know that my tempo was the same as in rehearsal. Um, yeah. So, uh, we could also talk a little bit about the um, composers today. Um, it's hard to it's hard to get works published. Yes, Lud Ludwig. Good question. Yeah, is yeah. it is it possible that that singer just might have not have latched on to the tempo well enough? Um, no, no, absolutely not. It was a long introduction. Uh -huh. It was with the orchestra. Of, it was with the orchestra of St. Luke's. Uh -huh. It doesn't get better than that, you know. And he just decided to <laughs> do his own tempo. <laughs> I don't know why. Okay. But uh, I don't know. Um. Oh, I'll tell you about when I commissioned twenty-five of America's leading composers to celebrate the twenty-fifth anniversary of my professional choir. 
I didn't have much money to spend. I raised money and for this purpose, but I only had an honorarium, let's say, I don't want to give the amount, but I, I approached, you know, John Curigliano first, and he saw, he signed up, and then I started approaching others, but I was, I was um, very careful to mention that John Curigliano has signed up, so the next guy said, oh, I'll sign up, you know, so I got, you know, John Harbison, and, and Augusta Reed Thomas, and Stephen Stuckey, I mean, it was a Chen Yi, I, it was incredible. Um, but you know they were they were willing to do it for very little, because some of them, some of those pieces were really complex, and they wanted to write for a, a group that could do very tough music. Um, yeah, I don't, I, I didn't even have a written contract with them, which, you know, because I have a reputation in the field for, in for, paying up. You know, I never screwed anybody in that regard. Um, one year I lost twenty three thousand dollars on and uh i was a mess and one of my board members loaned me the money he said pay, pay me back when you can and i did but it's what a what a wild ride it has been uh, you know great a great time as heather knows i'm stopping my canticum novum singers after next season it's the 50th season and i'll end it with the b minor mass and then you know i'll cry a lot and then i'll just concentrate on all the other things i still do with my life um so i've gotten yes from heather speaking of well-known conductors and composers did you ever meet or observe robert Shaw? no alice oh alice parker well i've met alice parker you you wrote a robert Shaw slash alice parker no i never had the privilege of meeting robert Shaw. i did meet alice parker once and we, we had a nice conversation, but uh, yeah, he was a great con con conductor, obviously. So was Greg Smith of, of the Greg Smith Singers. Um, did I ever tell you I held the hand of Salieri? Uh, that doesn't make any sense, right? But the who, who portrayed Salieri in the movie Amadeus? F. Murray Abraham. So I did something with the Brooklyn Philharmonic and F. Murray Abraham was the narrator. And after the performance, we all came on stage. You know, I trained the choir, Robert Spano conducted, and he's next to me and he takes my hand and we all bowed. So now I can say I held the hand of of, uh, Am Amade of uh, Salieri, as opposed to Morricone. When I first met him, I went like this to shake his hand and he went like this, like he wanted me to kiss his hand. Oh, I should have realized that the experience was not gonna be very good. He even yelled full blast at his orchestra. The poor guys, they, they flew over from Rome and they flew from Rome. They didn't even go to their hotel. They came to um, uh, the, yeah, it was, it was the uh, uh, General Assembly of the United Nations. They came an hour late, they couldn't help it. So Morricone is standing up shouting at them at the top of his lungs for being late. And the, one of the cellists was standing up yelling at the top of his lungs at, at any over whoa no wonder i needed a, a valium which i didn't take um okay what else i have copious notes here so um my experience with conductors and composers um yeah these mendelssohn brought back brought bach back to life mendelssohn composed uh great composer Mendelssohn conducted Bach St. Matthew Passion. And up until then, his music was lying dormant, basically. Um, most, I think most orchestral conductors have really good technique, conducting technique, I do. Most choral conductors don't. Um, so for, for whatever reason, they just don't. So they need help. Yeah, I, I remember one. Yeah, I remember one cellist, Peter Rosenfeld. He went to Queens College, or taught there many decades ago. He was the first cellist of an orchestra. I won't tell you which one, but in the intermission of the concert, the orchestra goes off stage. He stayed on stage, just fiddling around with his cello, you know, plucking. And I walked up to the stage. I said hi, um, and he said he just started complaining about it. he couldn't follow the conductor. <laughs> 
So are they trained to conduct differently? That's the problem. Uh, most most choral conductors are not trained very well, and some are not trained at all. Um, my niece, Rebecca Rosenbaum, runs New England's best uh, girls choir. She has like 400 kids. It's, it's unbelievable. And she got a doctorate in choral conducting from Yale. And she's brilliant. But she, one thing she told me was she studied with, you know, with her teacher there for years, but they never actually did conducting technique. That's like when I took tennis, I took a course, a tennis course in Queens College, and I learned how to play tennis, but they never taught us how to serve. So I never played tennis after that. You can't play tennis if you don't know how to serve. Um, no, seriously, like organists, organists are, are the worst conductors, but they have to conduct from the organ. But when they're standing up in front, I mean, I'm, I'm not dissing organist. I'm an organist myself of sorts. In fact, I'll learn how to play the Gorgon pedal someday. I don't really use the pedals very much, but my little beautiful country church tolerates me. Um, yeah, they, they, you know, they just don't know how to conduct and they don't use the hands independently. Crescendo, decrescendo, cueing, cutting off, you know, they just don't know how to do it. And it's not easy to, uh, if you go to, if you go on YouTube, uh, just type in Rosenbaum conducting. I gave a 21 minute lesson on the, all the basics, most of the basics of conducting. And uh, yeah, it's, it's hard to, to have it all. It's hard to, uh, you know, be a psychologist and, and be a great musician and good rehearsal technique and good conducting physical technique, you know, it's tough. So anything else? Your two other books, yeah. Harold, those are um, like kind of- uh, One is for conductors. Conducting. Yeah, one is for conductors and one is for composers. Um, they're very cheap. If you, if you are, uh, in fact, if you are, what is it called? Like a un Kindle Unlimited or, you know, you can get things for free. You can get my books for free. Is it Kindle or what's the other one? I forget. No, I think it, yeah, I saw that. Kindle Unlimited. Yeah. Yeah. It's for free mm -hmm. or else it's five five ninety nine to download it, you know, <laughs> or something like that. Yeah. Well, the composer... I mean, I, I've been hired a number of times to, to by the American Music Center, which which along with Meet the Composers became New, New Music USA, and by ASCAP to give lectures to composers um, on how to write for choirs. So that book is how to write for choirs. Um, here's a story about Milton Babbitt. I mean, I, I know it's 8.03, but I'll just, uh, Liz said I can have a few more minutes. Um, Milton Babbitt, one of the giants of the 20th century, he gave me a piece because I was working with G. Shermer. I have my own series with G. Shermer. He gave me a piece. The Kiri, uh, uh, it's called Music for the Mass. He wrote it in 1938. It's it's tonal. And the Kyrie is stapled together. The Gloria is stapled together. You know, and, and he said, my boy, get this published for me, would you? Me? I mean, Milton, you're like the most famous comp composer in the world. Why are you giving this to me? So I gave it to Shermer, and they didn't deal with it for a, quite a while. Um, so I, I had to like yell at them, like, come on, this guy's going to be 94 in a few weeks. Let him have his piece published. But anyway, I was busy, so I didn't get to it uh, for a week or two, and then I couldn't find the credo, the third mo movement. You know, the Kyrie, the Gloria, the credo, the Sanctus, the Agnus Dei. Um, I couldn't find the credo, so I called him up. I said, Milton, that's Harold. He said, hi, my boy. I said, <laughs> I, said I can't find the, I didn't write a credo. I don't believe in credos. Right. So I was relieved. It was a mass for <laughs> Kyrie, Gloria, skip the credo, Sanctus and Agnus Dei. But my point is that he wrote this piece where he had accents above weak syllables. And sometimes he would have weak syllables on very high pitches. And I, I, I completely edited it. I, I took out all the accents and all the high notes, which shouldn't be accented, but I, I wouldn't dare publish it or submit it for actual publication until I ran every single thing by him. And I did. And I showed him my markings. He said, oh yeah, great. Let's publish it the way you did it, you know. So even the greatest composers can be, you know, 
can be persuaded, can be can learn after hearing their music. Well, look at Tchaikovsky. I mean, Tchaikovsky heard a performance of his music and then completely, you know, rewrote portions of it. You know, he constantly doing that. Okay. Anything else? Yeah, great. And this will be archived, so you can always uh, watch it. And maybe, the and maybe this one will be the second most views. I was telling Harold before he started that his program that he did for us last summer has 744 views on our YouTube channel, far surpassing any other program we have on there. That's nice. <clears throat> That's nice to hear. And I really appreciate well, doing doing this, Harold. This is great. My, oh, I love it. Thanks so much, Harold. And um, everyone have a good night.